Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Dr. Norm Robillard is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out his amazingly educational discussion on episode 151 on Boundless Body Radio. Dr. Norm is the founder of the Digestive Health Institute. He is a strong advocate of drug and antibiotic-free dietary and integrative solutions for functional gastrointestinal disorders and various forms of gut dysbiosis. He turned his own suffering from GERD and IBS into a mission to create the fast-track diet for acid reflux, LPR, IBS, as well as SIBO, and other related health conditions. He created the Fast Track Diet to give people science-based treatment options for better gut health. His award-winning app and his Fast Track Digestion book series make it easy to try the Fast Track Diet. Dr. Norm, welcome back to Boundless Body Radio. Hey, Casey. Thanks for having me back. That that doesn't happen every time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I was so excited to get you back. And I've been practicing that introduction basically since the last time I talked to you. And I did a lot better with it. I have to say, I got through some of the big words. <laughs> All right, we'll try to simplify it. <laughs> <laughs> you do too much with uh, really complicated things, and we so appreciate your work. And yeah, definitely appreciate you coming back on our show. Um, it was really funny. We we hung up last time, and you and I got to talking a little bit, and we got to talk about how, um, you know, being in Boston, how special the Boston Marathon is to you. And we've hosted Dave McGillivray, who is just the wonderful, you know, race director. Uh, at the time of this recording, that race is going to happen um, for the first time, to my knowledge, in the fall um, on Monday. But you have um, some pretty incredible stories of the Boston Marathon. Can you share some of the things that you've gone through with that? Well, you know, yeah, just, you know, living in Watertown, which is just outside of Boston. So we've been to the races and hung out and it's a, it's a lot of fun, but I was kind of surprised to see uh, an interesting story um, unfold in this very area. Some Harvard researchers were, um, they got interested in um, what happens at the beginning and after a marathon race, you know, with these elite athletes pushing the envelope. And they wanted to know what happened with their gut microbes, the bacteria and, and other organisms in their, in their gut at the beginning and, and more importantly, at the end of the race. And um, they found that there was an increase in this bacteria called Villanella atypica in some of these elite athletes. They, they um, basically um, cultured it from their stool and they were really interesting, interested in this bacteria because of its type of metabolism, first of all. It, it's one of, and there are other strains of bacteria in the gut that do this, but instead of breaking down and fermenting carbohydrates itself, it uses lactate or lactic acid as fuel. And, and lactate in the gut is made by other um, uh, types of bacteria, lactobacillus species and others that produce lactate as an end product. And this bacteria takes that and it um, processes that into propionic acid and makes a living that way. So it gets its own energy to live by, by doing that transformation. Um, but what is also interesting is propionate the short chain fatty acid is useful as a fuel for our body. Um, colonocytes that line the intestine can use it for fuel. Um, our muscles can burn propionate. So they hypothesized that these elite runners, when they were really exhausted and pushing the envelope and they weren't oxygenating enough, you know, they weren't, the oxygen wasn't reaching their muscle cells, the muscle cells will change over from aerobic respiration where they burn glucose and the end products of carbon dioxide and water to fermenting the glucose and the end product is lactic acid. And so, you know, you've probably heard of that, right? That makes your muscles sore, it builds up. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and so your body, most people were focused on, on one of the main ways the body gets rid of this buildup of lactic acid. Um, one is it, goes through the bloodstream to the liver and the liver, when oxygen returns and it's well oxygenated, it, it will break that down and it will inevitably convert it back to glucose. But they hypothesized that in this instance, what was happening is this lac lactic acid, when it builds up in the muscles and going in the bloodstream, but some of it was being 
was getting diffusing across the intestinal membranes and reaching these bacteria. And it was just, you know, kind of an interesting theory at the time. But what they did was isolate one of these microbes, this Villanella atypica, um, that was increased after the race, purified it, grew it, and they gave it to mice. And then they put them on the treadmill. And they published, I think this was published in Nature a couple of years back. Um, they found that the mice could run 13% longer. Wow. They had more endurance with this microbe in their gut. And so they filed some patents and published some papers. And there's, you know, you, people can Google it. There's a lot of information on it. But they're basically trying to um, convert this or, or develop this strain of bacteria into, you know, something for performance, a probiotic for performance. Wow. So I thought that was kind of an interesting story. That's um, amazing. You know, Given your discipline in particular. Oh, absolutely. I mean, any performance enhancement most endurance athletes can get, they're going to jump all over. So that's a really interesting way to think about that. And, and so cool that it's, you know, the Boston Marathon that that kind of came from. Um, can you can you tell us what happened in 2013? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Boston Marathon bombers. <laughs> um, honestly, it's, it's funny you should mention that because I um I forgot it was 2013. So, so Is that thanks, right? for the thanks for the reminder. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell my story? <laughs> so, um yeah, when that was happening, you know, this was some days after, right? When they were looking for these guys, the brothers. They had uh, they were trying to get out of town and they ended up uh, shooting, killing a Cambridge, you know, police officer and stealing the car and all of that. And so you've heard about that story, but the I guess the the police, the investigators got tipped off and they kind of chased them down in Watertown, the town that I live in, and, you know, kind of blocked them in. And of course, they, uh, you know, tried to get down shooting and driving the car into the police cars. And one of the brothers got killed and run over. And the other brother, the younger brother, ran off and um, they couldn't find him. And so we got that this robocall in, in the middle of the night. And, uh, you know, we get up two in the morning and, and the first thing that came to mind was, yeah, maybe these guys turn on CNN. And sure enough, helicopters everywhere. They, they were searching for this other brother in in Watertown. And it just so happened that it was a pitch dark night. Up. There was no moon. So and I don't have a gun. At, at least I don't have a gun with bullets. So uh, I looked out the back window and it was just pitch dark in my backyard. And they're, and, and they're saying on this robocall and on TV, all residents shelter in place. And so, you know, that's what we're doing. And we're thinking, well, what's, you know, what's our weapon? What do we have a frying pan? You know, if one of these guys tries to get into the house, because we didn't have much information. We couldn't see anything outside. And so this went on all night, all through the next day. And everybody was supposed to shelter in place. And um, at some point, I had been uh, friends with a, a weatherman out in Colorado. He was he was one of the first readers of of my fast track digestion book, and it it helped him with his heartburn. So we had become friends. So he got in touch with me, and I said, "Yeah, it's you know, it's helicopters. There's guys with uh, you know dogs and military people searching the street here." Unfortunately, they're searching on the other side. They're not searching on my side. I think I was just outside of the area of interest. Oh, and so, so nobody was searching our backyard. But I said, yeah, that's what's going on. So he put me on with their producer and the radio station out in Colorado. So I was kind of giving it to them blow by blow what was going on in the neighborhood, which wow. was interesting. <laughs> but then um, I, think this, I guess this might have been just when I got off the phone with them, but uh, the activity really started to pick up later that afternoon and the helicopters were just really going over close. And so I ended up going outside in the front yard and, and I was looking at these helicopters and, and all of a sudden I thought, oh man, that helicopter's, you know, got engine trouble because it just sounded like, you know, all of this noise in rapid succession. Well, it turns out what that was, was the, uh, this task force shooting at this guy in a boat at the bottom of my street, he was oh, hiding man. in a boat and somebody had identified him and somebody, I don't know if they gave the word or what, but they just started, you know, pelting this boat. It was so, you know, must've been 500 rounds being fired off. Wow. So, um, 
anyway, eventually it came to an end and they captured him. But it was uh, it was quite an event, eventful evening and, and day following. <laughs> That's crazy. I can't believe it was that close to you. Was that the the first and last day of your on the ground reporting adventure career? <laughs> yeah, that was that was it. Yeah, it was literally at the bottom of my street, maybe a half a mile away. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that story. I just think it's so fascinating and very real. Um, when we ended our episode last time, I asked you for one simple tip for the listener, and you came up with two. And the first thing you said is less less food, less anything coming into the system. I wonder if you found that to be the case with all of life, that we we just are constantly craving more of everything and most of us could be doing a lot better with less. You know, I, I personally think there is something to that. I, you know, with diet, certainly less is more, less frequent meals, smaller serving sizes, intermittent fasting, meal spacing. I'm really convinced. But as I was just the other day, I was thinking about that as well. And I thought, you know, maybe it's just it's more than just diet. You know, maybe uh, maybe I should just write a book. Less is more. I love it. Everything <laughs> across the board. Right. I would and so it. I went on Amazon and I said, well, let me just see what's out there. Oh, yeah. There's a lot out there. It's been done. It's been done and done and done and done and done. <laughs> Well, it's funny, yeah, so. like I have books in my, in my audible that are like crush it and smash it and go hard and <laughs> do all this stuff. And I like, I never read those. I always want to hear books called less is more and simple simplicity. And, you know, things like, um, you know, one I'm listening to now is, is love people use things, you know, it's such an interesting concept. And I, I felt like it was definitely true of diet. And, and like you, I agree. I, I think it's a, a great life lesson for us to learn. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, most people I work with, you know, as, as we talked about before, I'm a consulting microbiologist. I work with people with IBS, GERD, SIBO, various forms of dysbiosis. And along the way, they have other problems oftentimes, too. So I, I basically consult with them and they can take my notes to the doctor with them and so forth. But I can't tell you how often I, I meet with people that they're so focused on just what can I take? What can I eat? Should I eat some avocados? Should I take a probiotic? Should I take a supplement? Should I take some medicine? Should I, you know, and it's it's almost the, the, the way the world works now, you know, and, and of course it's promoted by by the industry, uh, pharma, supplement industry, you know, obviously people want to sell the stuff and if it works, that's really great. But I do think that some people are just, that's what their focus is and, and they forget the part about, wow, maybe I'm kind of overdoing it. I, I work with people sometimes they're on 45 or 50 supplements a day. Wow. It's impossible to predict the, the result of that. And most of these things, none of them require for, for dietary supplements require FDA approval or extensive testing. Um, and so it's not predictable. That's what I don't like about it. And I'm, I'm more of a cautious person. I, 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 I don't like to put a lot of stuff in my body unless I really understand what the heck it is and, uh, you know, what's happened before. Like even uh, cipro ciprofloxacin is an antibiotic. I worked on the development of Cipro when I worked at Bayer. And, you know, I used to teach a sales training class for, for new sales recruits when I was there. Most of my work was research, but I do this. And I, so I get together with these sales guys. And, you know, they were popping the Cipro when they had a cold or a sore throat or anything. And all the years I worked there, I never took any because, yes, it's a life saving antibiotic. But, you know, we just didn't know that much about it. It was just approved. And if you don't really have a serious infection, what the heck are you doing taking that? Mm -hmm. And of course, now in hindsight, we see, you know, it is a lifesaver, but also there's some significant health risks and side effects from taking these, uh, you know, no small uh, part is um, the huge impact on our gut microbiome. You know, they, uh, just a huge, and there's been studies on that with Cipro and other antibiotics. So, um, and then there's Achilles tendon ruptures and so forth. So there's, you should not be fooling around with these things unless you really have a problem. That, you know, I think that sums it up. Yeah, no, I love that. That's great. One of the other last tips that you gave us, um, I'd love to take a bit of a, you know, deep dive into, you talked about chewing. What does proper chewing look like to, for you? Yeah. And, you know, for some people don't need to do that. Uh, a lot of young people, they don't have any GI issues. They, uh, 
they can just, uh, you know, wolf down on their lunch or burgers or whatever they're eating. And, and they seem to have, you know, tolerate it fine. And I was like that when I was younger. But as I get into my 30s, um, and especially my early 40s, I started suffering with chronic acid reflux. And when I discovered the power of diet for, for helping my own situation and just really how, how powerful it was to, to not consume so many carbohydrates, especially these fermentable carbohydrates. And I talked to you about this theory I came up with and I wrote about um, in the past. But so with me, I found out it was kind of a progression. So this advice might not be critical for everybody, but I think as we get a little older, it is good advice to keep in mind, when, especially when you have, start to have some GI symptoms. And even younger people do. Um, you know, as a young kid, I used to have some IBS symptoms before I went out to the bus stop in the morning, got cramps and had to go to the bathroom. So maybe in my case, it would have benefited me at that point, too. And that the idea of eating slowly and chewing well, it, it is important on so many levels. First of all, when you do that and, and, you know, I guess the most extreme version of that would be some people say chew 25 or 30 times. Some people say chew until the food is completely liquefied. Um, but chewing well and eating slowly presents these nutrients to your stomach and digestive tract in, in a little bit more of a controlled fashion, right? So you're not processing as much at the same time. That's one benefit. The other thing is um, chewing is part of the way that we break up food particles that does make food easier to digest. Our stomach, yes, it will churn things around and so forth. And there's also a lot of you know, uh, muscular activity throughout our intestines as the foods moving through there and digesting. But chewing is part of that process. So if we skip that, we're skipping part of the process. So that's kind of a second thing. Mm. A third thing that, that I think is really important has to do with starches, right? When we consume starches, potatoes, French fries, rice, butternut squashes, things that have high starch contents. Um, there's an, amyl, uh, an enzyme in our saliva called amylase, and that breaks down starches. And, and there's a couple of different types of starches. Amylose, which is hard to digest. It's a little more like a fiber. And amylopectin, which is easier to digest. But this amylase enzyme in our saliva works on both of those starch molecules but in a kind of a different way because the amylose is more linear and less branched. The amylase enzyme has to nip off these glucose units from the end of the molecules. There's not as many branch points. So it's a slower process, whereas amylopectin is highly branched. So the enzyme can grab onto all of these different ends. And so it can digest amylopectin starch faster. Um, now, there's more amylase enzyme, a different type of amylase enzyme released from your pancreas when the food enters your small intestine. But there's a reason that we have the amylase in our saliva because it helps get a stop, get a, a jump on digesting these starches. And who, some people digest starch really well, and some people have many gene copy numbers for the salivary amylase. And so they have a lot of amylase in the saliva, up to 60% of the protein in the saliva is this amylase enzyme. And it's interesting, there's probably an evolutionary strategy if they, they, if they or their ancestors or their genes evolved, maybe closer to the equator and they had a lot of starch in the diet, that would have been useful, right? So you can imagine those people nearer the equator may have had higher copy numbers and more amylase. And what's interesting is there's been several studies on this, and one of them um, actually said people with the higher amylase copy numbers also have better control of blood sugar. Mm. Now, there's no way that amylase has anything to do with your blood sugar. If anything, breaking down starches faster would shoot your blood sugar up. So why would they have better control of the blood sugar unless they had developed additional um, ways to deal with starches because of where they evolved? Other people have very few copy numbers for amylase and, and don't have as much in their saliva. So make a long story short, right? Eating slowly and chewing well, um, if you don't know how much amylase is in your saliva, and I don't think there's a commercial test in the US at least for that yet, but one way to, to take advantage of what you do have is just by slowing things down.
Yeah, slowing down. I mean, that's even just like tasting food, tasting your meal that you prepared or somebody prepared for you. I think that's wonderful advice. And that makes a lot of sense to me too. Like the, the, they don't seem related to each other, but as you know, the, the full system that would make a lot more sense. I'm glad you brought up starches because last time we mentioned resistant starch. Can you tell us what a resistant starch is? Right. Yeah. So there, there's different types of um, uh, configurations of starch in food. And people have put, you know, put it into classifications. Um, you know, there's there's type R uh, resistant starch one, two, three, and four. And four is kind of a synthetic manufactured starch, so maybe forget about that. But um, and then one has to do with the the nature of the starch molecules themselves. And we already talked a little bit about that, right? One type is amylopectin. That's the more resistant starch. I'm, I'm sorry, amylose is the more resistant starch. And amylopectin is the one that's easier to digest. Now, both these starches are in um, starch containing, most starch containing foods, right? So if you have some rice or you have a potato, there's both types of starch in most of those. Um, although there is, there are some exceptions and the fast track diet takes advantage of that. Uh, for instance, jasmine rice has very little amylose and it's mostly amylopectin. So it's no surprise that the glycemic index of um, uh, jasmine rice is very high, over 90. So it means it's almost it's digested almost as fast as glucose absor and absorbed into the bloodstream. That's what the glycemic index measures, how quickly the carbs go into the bloodstream compared to glucose. And so jasmine rice is very high in glycemic index, so it's digested and absorbed quickly. So if you're somebody with gut issues and you're worried about your bacteria being overfed and producing too much gas, Jasmine rice might be a better choice for you, but don't consume too much, especially if you have blood sugar issues, right? Because it will be absorbed and raise your blood sugar more quickly. Um, sushi rice is, is another one. It's a short grain Japanese rice. In fact, it's pretty much, for the most part, the only rice variety they grow in the entire island of Japan, um, except for mochi rice, which is used for desserts and so forth. Um, that has all 100% amylopectin, the easy to digest starch. It has no um, amylose. And they believe it was a mutation in this rice variety thousands of years ago and so forth. But like jasmine rice, it's a very high glycemic index. And when you go by the formula in the fast track diet, where we're interested in this fermentation potential, this FP calculation, it's the opposite of the glycemic index. So it's a low FP easier to consume without having a lot of GI issues. Um, but again, like, like um, jasmine rice, eat a half a cup, you know, don't, don't go crazy on it because yeah, you don't want to get blood sugar issues either. Mm. So if I uh, have, if I have sushi rice that's been cooked and then cooled, what is that type of effect versus if I just cook that same type of rice? Yeah. So good point in general, when you cook and then cool starches, right? There's something that develops and it is another one of these physical types of starch configurations um, where it becomes more resistant, right? It gets um, kind of crystallized. And so it's, it's more like a fiber, harder to digest. And so, so you can, to some extent, if you warm it up well and keep it moist, you can re-gelatinize some of that crystallized starch. Um, so if you if you had to eat, and you were somebody with heartburn or IBS or SIBO or dysbiosis, and you had these GI issues, altered bowel habits, um, all of these different symptoms, and you were worried about it, if you if you did cook and cool a rice or other starches, you would warm it up well and make sure you sprinkled a little more moisture in there to keep it moist and, and, and get it nice and hot. That would re-gelatinize some of that resistant starch, which would be helpful. Now, a finer point of this is this crystallization of starch is a bigger deal with amp high amylose starch, less with amylopectin. So, you know, it's not a perfect world if you tried it with <clears throat> your sushi rice um, you know, it still might not be quite as good if it was uh, cooled and 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 uh, some crystallization, crystallization, maybe not much, but some might occur, might get a little dried out. 
you know, I wouldn't trust it 100%, but it would be better than a variety that had very high levels of amylose, this resistance dye. And then one more point while we're on this whole thing about um, amylase enzyme and starch digestion um, and resistant starch is we're still assuming that even people with some of these GI issues that and, and maybe they don't have quite as much amylase in their saliva. That's one issue we talked about. But there are other problems that you have to be on the lookout for. And, and remember, we had talked before about these 25 or 30 potential underlying or contributing causes for poor digestion and to make to drive these SIBO reactions and drive these functional GI issues, right? There's a lot of these things. But here's three that are relevant to this conversation. Low salivary amylase, we talked about that. Low pancreatic amylase. And um, you know, you had talked about your interest in stool, comprehensive stool testing. Well, one of the tests in this type of stool testing is an enzyme called elastase. And that elastase is an en enzyme made by the pancreas, but it's a tough enzyme, so it survives in a stool sample. So you can measure it in these stool tests. But what you're really interested in is how's my pancreas doing? If you have, have low amylase, you know, and the, the cutoff is somewhere below 200, I think it's micrograms per gram of, of stool. That's the cutoff. If, you're, if your um, elastase levels are much lower, like say they're 120, that, that is telling you that your pancreas might not be doing so well. Well, your pancreas also produces a different type of amylase enzyme. It produces lipase and protease. So if you're not sure your, your um, pancreas is producing these digestive enzymes that well, starches um, and some other foods could be problematic for you. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, there's something called brush border enzymes. They're disaccharidases, which means they're enzymes that break down um, double sugars like sucrose and maltose and lactose. So lactase for instance, we hear about lactase, that's a brush border enzyme. Well, they're not just released into the gut lumen, they stick out from the microvilli and they're kind of anchored there, most of them. Some, some get broken off. But, and those, not only do they complete the breakdown of these disaccharides, lactose, sucrose, maltose, but they're also critical for the final breakdown of starch because amylase enzymes don't break down starches all the way to glucose. Starches are made of glucose, right? They're polymers of glucose. But they break it down instead to two and three sugar molecules, trisaccharides, and they're still stuck in your gut until the brush border enzymes, especially sucrase and isomaltase, complete the breakdown of these starch molecules. So um, and I was just reading a study not too long ago. Uh, there's a couple of them out there. This most recent one was uh, was a hospital in, in Moscow, I believe, uh, and they found that it's it's not hard, it's not easy to test these enzymes. You need to go in and take an endoscopic sample of the small intestine, send it to a highly specialized lab. But they found people with these GI disorders often had deficiencies in these brush border enzymes. Mm. And you could imagine they might get knocked around if you had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, bacteria that migrate up and overgrow in the small intestine. They, they release proteases that could degrade these enzymes. They create an inflammatory environment. So all I'm saying is that the fast track diet tells you, hey, if you use this FP calculation and you use sushi rice or you know jasmine rice or red potatoes, it's going to be easier for you to digest compared to other rices or potatoes. But you still have to keep in mind, is, is my digestion perfectly intact or do I have some of these issues? And that's kind of the root cause piece. And there's a chapter in the Fast Track Digestion books about root causes. So it, it talks about these issues. Mm. Yeah, I, and I find that app in the calculator so fascinating. It's cool because I just get to see the numbers and then make the decision about what I want to do. I mean, I'm fortunate enough that I don't have to suffer with any, you know, gastrointestinal issues, but the people I work with who do, I mean, they're in a world of pain. And so to be able to use that calculator oh, yeah. and just be become more aware of these things, because I, I don't think many people would consider that. And you make it so easy with the app and the calculator. 
Yeah, well, they, right. And there's a calculator on the website, but there's also a built-in calculator in the fast tracked diet mobile app. So that also makes it easier. And when you even just create your own meals by pulling in foods or whatever from the many tables of 1200 different foods, it will do all of that, the calculations for you in terms of the FP. Yeah. Um, wow. Calculator. Great. It's such a well-designed tool and well thought out. I, I really have loved using it. I'm, I'm, you know, really curious too. You mentioned school, stool testing, excuse me. Um, I wanted to ask you about this last time. We didn't get around to it. What other kinds of fascinating things can we learn from doing stool testing? Hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny. I, it's one of the preferred tools I, I use when I work with people with complex, you know, digestive health issues. I've heard people say before, well, stool testing, it might be interesting, but it's not very actionable. Well, you know, as a microbiologist, I would disagree because, but you have to be really following the research. Um, but here's just kind of a, I don't have one in front of me, but here's a loose summary of some of the things that are, that are covered in, and, and you want a comprehensive stool test. You, your doctor can order one that'll just say, okay, you don't have any parasites, you know, but you want one of these comprehensive um, stool tests. Um, there's, there's several good ones out there now. They're very competitive with each other. I like uh, Genova's GI effects test, but there are, there are several out there, several good ones. Um, but it, and, and you can order these um Online. In fact, I send people to places where they can buy them. They, you know, you 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 don't have to have a doctor order them for you. You can get them direct, um, and they'll send it to your house. And you provide a stool sample and just send it back. And then some weeks later, you'll you'll get these results. But here's some of the things they look at. Um, they they do look at pathogens, bacterial, fungal, viral, protozoan pathogens, worms, flukes, you know, a whole variety of, of pathogenic organisms. Wow. Um, there are some specific add-ons you can get um, that, that oftentimes we might be interested in knowing. If, for instance, if I work on somebody and I suspect they might be at risk for gastritis or low stomach acid and they haven't been tested for H. pylori, helicobacter pylori, a stomach that bores through the mucus in your, and anchors on your stomach lining. And over time, it will damage the lining of your stomach. And depending on where these little colonies form, it will damage those particular cells. So it can damage cells that are involved in regulation of stomach acid, and you can end up being having hyperchlorhydria, too much stomach acid. Or if it, if it makes colonies near your parietal cells in the body of your stomach, it can damage those cells, and you can end up with being hypochlorhydric, having too little or no stomach acid, and also you can be deficient in um, the protein that the parietal cell makes that helps you absorb um, vitamin B12 called intrinsic factor. So if I suspect somebody could be at risk I, and they don't know, I do want them to get an H. pylori test. And that the, a very good way to test that is stool antigen. So you can get that as an add-on with these stool tests. Um, you can get add-ons for zonulin, which is a protein that's a, a marker linked to um, tight junction issues, in, increased intestinal permeability, leaky gut. So you can get zonulin added on. And, and zonulin might not be an end-all for, for intestinal permeability, but at least it could flag an issue. And then you could get more advanced testing for, for um, intestinal permeability. Um, so there's that, there's these add-ons. But it, in addition to all these pathogens, it will also look at, uh, and, and this is a quantitative look at all of your commensal microbes, all of these populations in, from these different phyla, from Macutes, Bacteroidetes, Proteobacteria, Verrucomicrobia, Actinobacteria, you know, some kind of strange sounding names. But, and, and then within those, there's certain genus and species of all of these bacteria that make up these thousand or so species um, and tr hundreds of trillions of bacteria in our gut. Well, it will give you a readout of those and say whether you're, um, and of course, everybody's microbes are different. Right? You need to understand that. There's at least 30%, you know, a different person to person uh, shifts in these populations. But if you are severely deficient and some specific ones, again, it might make you say, what's going on here? Like, for instance, uh, one of the Firmicutes bacteria is called Ficalibacterium prausnitzii, right? 
It's a prominent butyrate anti-inflammatory bacteria in our gut and usually makes up, I don't know, 10% of the microbes in our gut. So it's a big player. It's an anaerobe. It lives by uh, near the mucosal surface. It's a key player. And I've had more than one client I've worked with. They don't have any of it. It's like, okay, wow. Well, what's up with that? You know, what's going on there? Um, because where else do you see that? Uh, you see it in people diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease. Now, if somebody has no Faecalibacterium prausnitia, that does not mean they have Crohn's or, um, or, or um, any kind of inflammatory bowel disease, but it at the very least makes you want to look at some inflammatory markers. And a good one that's in these comprehensive stool tests, most of them, is a protein called calprotectin. It's released, released by neutrophils, neutrophils at the site of inflammation. And um, so it, people with Crohn's disease tend to have very high levels of that calprotectin. So if you have low F. prosnitzii, but you also have low calprotectin, okay, maybe we need to look in a different direction. Um, another big one is um, we talked about these Veruco microbia, kind of funny looking microbes. They... Um, they live on the mucus surface, mucosal surface. Um, the main one is Acamansa mucinophila, and it breaks down mucus, which which is mucus coats our entire digestive tract, right? And it's it's made up of these many different types of mucin molecules that have all of these roles. Some of them, um, uh, you know, protective and antimicrobial. Other ones. Um, you know, designed to specifically feed microbes in our gut. So this mucus in general is like uh, 80% polysaccharide. It's a food source for well-adapted gut microbes that have the key to the lock, so to speak, the enzymes to unlock these complex um, mucin molecules. And when they do, and like a mucinophila, acumensa mucinophila has the key, it can unlock the energy. And it's not, it's more than just energy. It's source of nitrogen, source of sulfur that's sulfated and so forth. These, these mucins are a complete food source for microbes. And so bacteria like A. mucinophila unlock it and cross-feed uh, a lot of the other bacteria. So, And then there's also um, some evidence that it may promote the growth of more of this mucus, or not growth, promote the production by the body of more of this mucus when it takes some away. And so overall, it might be healthy for the gut lining um, integrity. So again, when I see somebody that's very low in this, um, it, it kind of raises a red flag and makes me wonder. Wow. And ever, so there's a lot of, lot of research in this area right now. Do you ever just like sit back and marvel that like, we went to the moon 52 years ago, we made cell phones or, you know, iPhones 15 years ago, but there's still so much to learn going on inside of us all the time. It's insane. Oh, I know. Well, you know, speaking of uh, these phones, why do we need a new one every five years? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah. Th I, so I went to the store. They they had some stupid promotion. They were buying my old one back. So it made it like a, it was a very inexpensive, yeah, yeah. very inexpensive trade for a newer phone. I'm just looking at this thing. Like mm -hmm. I, I'm never going to use, you know, most of these features. I have no idea what this stuff does. I just, uh, I just want to be able yeah. to make zoom calls. <laughs> talk well, to you. Yeah, I need that new phone. It has seven lenses. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no thanks. <laughs> uh, so interesting. So so we've been talking about stool testing, which is different than fecal matter transplants, which is also seeming to be getting a lot of attention these days. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what we've learned about it? Um, sure. And by the way, when you, you mentioned um, the stool testing, I, I had gotten sidetracked on, on how excited I was on these, some of these Veruco microbia and, and permacutes. <laughs> But just to, I guess, tie that up, there's much more in the stool testing as well. It will look at plant fibers, uh, animal fibers, proteins. It will look at undigested fats. And so you get a, a little bit of a better bead there on digestion. It will look at these short chain fatty acids. We talked about propionate, right, in performance, but there's butyrate, anti-inflammatory. There's um, many of these short chain fatty acids. It will look at your um, ratios and how much you have in general. Um, I'm, I personally don't think you need a whole ton because remember you're measuring these in a stool sample where your body's already used what it needed. 
So on a lower carb diet, for instance, which I recommend to a lot of people not overdoing it on the carbs, those will go down a little bit, which I think is is um, okay. The other thing is the ratio of some of the big players like Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes together, those two groups, highly diverse and make up about 90% of the gut microbes in our gut. So there's seven of these different phyla, but those two are really criti critical. So they'll give you a readout on those in particular and also the ratio of those two, which can help because, which can help because for instance, on an animal-based diet, it shifts towards more of the Bacteroidetes. On a plant-based diet, it shifts more towards the, towards the Firmicutes. And also in obesity studies and epilepsy studies and IBS studies, there's more of these Firmicutes than Bacteroidetes. And so a lower carb diet will kind of shift that back into place. So I think there's a, um, I think that's also supportive of some people that have IBS and obesity and, and uh, epilepsy as well that you, and I think it provides so, uh, some support for lower carb or even ketogenic dieting in some cases. Like that's what they use for kids with epilepsy Yeah, that's and right. with, with good reason. So anyway, yeah, there's a lot more we could get into. It's a, it's a fascinating test, but um, wow. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So the other one was, uh, was FMT. Yeah, right? correct. Yep. You know, the, the FMT, I think follows along to, um, years ago, you know, way back to um, there was a Russian that was using sour milk as a supplement in the early 1900s, right? I think he eventually he got the Nobel Prize not for that, but smart guy. I forget his name offhand, but that was the first instance of using kind of lactic acid bacteria, and these are bacteria that ferment lacto fermented veggies and pickles and cabbage and uh, sauerkraut. Um, and they're also, you know, a lot of these lactic acid bacteria and, and uh, fermented milk products. Um, it thought to be generally healthy. So people have really um, kind of went off on developing all of these, you know, strains as probiotics. But because it was difficult to grow the anaerobic organisms, the ones that don't like oxygen, that, that comprise most of the bacteria in our gut. It's hard to grow those and put, and lyophilize them, freeze dry them, put them in a capsule. So instead, companies that made these would gravitate towards the lactobacillus species, the bifidobacteria strains, the bacillus or, or um, soil-based um, probiotics, basically because they were easy to grow. Now, there are some studies that show that some of these can be helpful, for instance, lactobacillus uh, Ruteri in um, constipation. Uh, there was one study that showed that people that were constipated and having four um, four uh, bowel movements a week, taking this for four weeks, it could go up to six bowel movements a week. Um, there's some um, uh, one study on Bacillus clausii, um, a, a soil-based probiotic that seems to help be helpful with IBSD and SIBO. Um, helping reduce SIBO in people with IBSD. Um, uh, Lactobacillus salivarius for leaky gut and, and SIBO, perhaps. So this, there are some studies out there showing some positive findings on some of these. But the real holy grail, I think, is some of these keystone anaerobic strains. You have to figure out how to grow and characterize and, and put these into a supplement for these anaerobes that that really hate oxygen. And so to get, you know, a bead on how that might help, I think that um, fecal microbiota transplantation is, is helpful because we're saying, all right, regardless of which strain you're deficient in or what your problem is, we're going to try to give you through either through um, a, a lavage tube that goes through your nose all the way down into your, you know, digestive tract or the other way through the bum. And then we'll see how you do. Now, where fecal microbiota transplantations have just been unbelievably amazing is with infections um, having to do with Clostridia difficile. Um, uh, this bacteria is, you know, it's in this Firmicutes group, but it does, it's not, it shouldn't be a normal inhabitant in our gut. Um, people that get infected with this, whether it's at the doctor's office or a nursing home or somewhere, they just, you know, fecal oral route got in contact with this microbe 
and it establishes in their gut. They can have, you know, terrible, you know, unrelenting diarrhea. They can lose their fluids. There's a high morbidity rate, right? Illness rate and mortality. It can kill some people over time from having the C. diff infection. And so the, the way to treat C. diff was to use powerful, broad spectrum combinations of antibiotics, which is just horrible on your overall microbiota, but that's what was needed to get this under control. And even in that situation, it was maybe, um, you know, 80%, 70 something percent effective. In some cases, it's not even 100% effective and it can come back and you can get resistance. Well, it turns out that, uh, that when they give somebody a colon cleanse and give them a fecal microbiota transplant from a healthy donor, the cure rate of this uh, pathogen is over 90%. Wow. Um, and, and very good safety profile. So these FMTs are amazing for this. So they thought, well, let's try it on some other things. What about inflammatory bowel disease? What about irritable bowel syndrome? How will it work for that? And so the first studies didn't do so well overall. It turns out that it's great for getting rid of C. diff with a fresh set of poop in your intestines. Um, it was not doing well in some of these IBS studies, for instance. And in fact, in one uh, or two of the studies, it, the placebo it looked a little better even. So you know, it might not be helping at all in some cases. But it also depends on who the donor is and how the donor is screened and what, you know, like if, if you give somebody a fecal microbiota transplant from somebody who's constipated, and let's say they have a lot of methane brevibacter smithii, it's an archaea organism in the gut that produces methane, and it's a constipating gas. If you use that person as the donor, and, and I think this even happened once as a case report on it, that somebody got a fecal microbiota transplant from somebody with the with these methane producers, and they ended up constipated. So you need to be kind of careful and know who the donor is. So having said all of that, there are a couple of studies that have been reporting some better results. Um, one or two studies out of China. I don't have the studies in front of me at the moment. Um, a study I was just looking at the other day out of Norway, where they gave people 30 or 60 grams of FMT from a healthy donor or their own poop as a control. And they found that the ones that got the 30 to 60 grams from a healthy donor with IBS there, and whatever they were measuring, you have to look carefully, are they measuring bloating and gas, but you know some of these lifestyle parameters and their symptoms, they were up to 89% better. Wow. So I think there's some hope here, but all studies haven't really given that kind of, most of them haven't. So I, again, I think it's really, for, for anything other than C. diff, it really still is in the realm of, of research. Interesting. I mean, it seems like all of this science, you know, it's it's so new. We're learning all the time things we thought were really important turned out not to be and vice versa. So that'll be interesting to follow over time. Um, you know, one thing that we are told too is that we need, you know, we need probiotics, but we also need prebiotics and we can buy pills and supplements and things like that to give us those things. What What is your opinion on probiotics and prebiotics? Mm. Yeah, well, probiotics, we just talked about about several, right? We, we, uh, and by the way, there's a new Akamensu mucinophila probiotic, um, which is, you know, maybe amazing, but it's still, still early as some people, it's on the market. Some people can get it. It's back ordered until, until, uh, until November because it's in demand. Um, there's a company in Belgium that is making a pasteurized version of a mucinophila <clears throat> based on research they've done for, um, uh, for obesity and prediabetes, that they find this bacteria doesn't have to be alive to impart its benefit. So they've come up with this um, pasteurized or heat killed probiotic. And they're trying to get that developed as kind of a medical food for these types of conditions for, for um, blood sugar control, diabetes, for obesity. Um, so that company's going full bore. Um, and then, and then there's a, I think a spinoff or uh, a company that's using uh, that's uh, got permission to market uh, the sacraments and mucinophila is, is an actual live probiotic. So both of those things are going on. So that's for the probiotics. For the prebiotics, 
you know, that's I think that's a perfect example of a double edged sword. Um, because on the one hand, you know, the, these microbes in our gut, these hundred trillion bacteria from a thousand species, they do need to eat. That's why they're there. They're, they're, they're with us for a reason. We give them protection. They are able to process complex carbohydrates and fibers that we don't digest, <clears throat> turn those into fats, the propionate we talk about, the butyrate and others. Um, those fats nourish us. So in Paleolithic times, when we couldn't find much to eat and we had to eat roots and um, anything we could find, these microbes in our gut would help process it into fat so we wouldn't starve to death. So that's that's the reason they're there. And But it's also the reason I think that there this idea developed that, um, well, we need to keep feeding them like the Hadza and like the caveman, we need to feed these microbes. So what do they eat? Fiber. So you should have more and more and more fiber. And some people may be able to tolerate a high fiber diet. And I have no problems with them doing that if they can do it. And, and maybe the, the only downside is they, they have a lot of you know gas out the other end and, and they don't care. All the roommates are guys, whatever, but I don't <laughs> care. But, um, then there are other people that the microbes in their gut are producing too much gas, whether it's hydrogen, which can lead to loose stools and other symptoms. Methane can lead to, you know, hard or slower transit constipation, um, hydrogen sulfide. And you're not exactly sure whether that's going to lead to loose, looser stools or not, but we know you don't want excess amounts of any of these three gases. And so if you want your microbes to produce less of these, you do have to put them on some kind of diet because as we talked about, they're already feeding on these mucins that your gut produces. So they have two fuel sources, you, the diet and, and the mucins. So the people I deal with, I find they're in a situation where they're having too much fermentation. And I don't buy this idea about, you know, setting these daily amounts of fiber, you know, that you, you've heard that probably that, well, in the U.S., people only consume 14 grams of fiber a day. Yeah, probably people don't want to consume much more because of the result of it. But then they go on to say, well, women sh should consume 28 grams a day and men 34. And that's the, that's the way it is. That's the will keep your gut microbes healthy. Well, having developed this FP calculation, this fermentation potential calculation, it counts in grams. It's a quantitative measure, not only of lactose and fructose and sugar alcohols and resistant starch but it also counts grams of fiber. And that's the way this, this formula is set up. Using the glycemic index for any food, any food that has the glycemic index or and, and the nutritional facts, then you could do the calculation or just look it up in the app. But that's measuring all of these different things. And so when I take that FP calculation and I, I say, okay, um, here's a person that um, is on a typical <clears throat> Western diet. Let's let's count up the fermentation potential of everything they're eating. Forget about fiber for just one second, because that will be included. And okay, they had uh, orange juice and an English muffin for breakfast. For uh, lunch, they had a, a cheeseburger and bun and some fries and a glass of milk. And then you know, in the afternoon they had you know a piece of pie. Whatever it is, you add it all up. And what I find is for the typical person on a Western diet, that's not on any kind of you know weight loss diet, that if you just add up all the stuff they're consuming, that they're actually getting about 150 grams of fermentable material. So forget about this 12 grams or 28 grams or 36, 150 when we, when we look at it this way. And so a lot of those people will end up having GI issues from so much fermentable material. And so I'm not saying don't have any and don't have any fiber and don't have any prebiotics, but I'm saying that for people with all of these symptoms and, and I mean, there's, and it's not just the gas relay. You can get abdominal pain, cramps, diarrhea, constipation, gas, bloating, distension, flatulence. But you can also get things like nausea, dehydration, fatigue, brain fog. So that's a sign of somebody that has too much of this 
you know, activity, whether it's SIBO that we've talked about or other forms of dysbiosis, and they also have a lot of gas. So I really think it's important to put their microbes on a diet. So that's not somebody I would say, you know, what you should do is on top of all the other fermentable material, why don't you take this prebiotic fructose oligosaccharide? Maybe that will help with your acid reflux. And I won't do that because I know all too well, right? There's an example of a fiber, fructose oligosaccharide. Our bodies don't break it down. The bacteria ferment it. There was a study in the 90s. They gave this to people with, with GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And then they put probes down their throat to measure reflux and acidity. And it turns out these people started refluxing like crazy. And they had terrible symptoms, all from just consuming this one extra thing, this fructose oligosaccharide. So it gets back to what we were talking about before. There are times when you know less is more. Yeah, that's how I think about prebiotics. There might be some isolated instances where certain types of fiber may um, help with this or that, but just be cautious. Mm. I, I love the example that you gave because unfortunately, that's kind of the reality of how people are eating. I just listened to a podcast with some doctor who promotes a um, 100% plant-based whole food diet that's free of sugar, oil, and salt. And like, he's been doing it for decades and I couldn't believe it. Like if you're going to do a vegan diet, like that's, <laughs> I guess the way to go. I mean, he was doing salad and the, the host asked him like, well, what do you, do you put dressing on your salad? And he was like, no, I put like lemon juice on it. Like, man, <laughs> no salt. So he's getting no, not much fat. No, like very low fat. Um, um, and, and all plant material. And again, like if you're going to do a vegan diet, he's not eating vegan Oreos. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> he's doing it with, with vegetables and very low starch and all that kind of thing. But, but the sad reality is, you know, not very many people can eat like that. And then normally eating just a bunch of crap that you find at the grocery store. Yeah. 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 You have to be careful and you have to keep in mind there's, there's two types of nutrients that are essential proteins and fats. Carbohydrates are not essential. Yeah, totally. I, <laughs> they provide calories. They can certainly be part of a healthy diet. I have my own organic garden out in the yard. I'm, I'm going to pull in the last of it next week. I have some butternut squash out there. I put those in the basement because I don't eat that much or that uh, big servings of that, but I, I do like it. I'll make it occasionally. But yeah, tomatoes and eggplant and all these uh, greens and herbs that I grow, um, Brussels sprouts, I'll be pulling those in over the next month. Um, and I'll, I'll parboil them and freeze them because we don't need a ton of them, but we do like them with our steak, you know, um, but you know, again, I'm not down on plant-based people. It can be done. And, uh, there's a, there is a way to do it. You, you will have to supplement and so forth. But, um, I, I just deal with people where for one reason or another, their, their GI symptoms have gone out of control. Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been another amazing conversation. Um, I am staring at another list of questions <laughs> that I and either didn't get to or um, you know added from this. And maybe in a few months we can have you back on for part three and we can discuss some more of this. I just don't think there's any kind of ceiling to how much we can get into some of these things. You bring such an interesting insight into this and helps us to kind of see things from a different point of view without being so extreme about it. So we'd love to have you back yeah. in the future to talk about some of these other things if you if you'd like to join us yeah you know i appreciate that and and um you know i'll uh, if i say it now that'll put me under pressure to do something but an, an area that i've been really interested in and, and starting to focus on more is this whole brain gut connection um it's fascinating research not everything is ready for prime time but uh there's some in, fascinating stories out there um, that have to do with the brain and, and brain issues and the gut microbe uh, populations. Um, Parkinson's disease is a big one. Um, Alzheimer's is one as well. So, um, yeah, I, th I think if you press me, I might do a little more homework on that. That's great. I'm absolutely going to press you. I just circled that question. And, and not only that, but also the gut skin connection, something that I see quite a bit of that I would love to understand mm -hmm. a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to mm -hmm. tweak our final question for you and say, what would, what would one thing somebody could do that is experiencing severe gut issues? Where do they start? What should they do as a simple tip to get started on a road to better health? Mm. Well, um, the one thing they could do is call 844-495-1151 and have a chat with me and we'll see what's going on and I'll 
try to put together a plan for them. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. We just, we love, you know, how you share your message and how well you work with people. I mean, you told us last time when you start working with somebody, you, you put on your detective hat and you really take that person under your wing and, and really try to individualize everything and help people. And we just love people that go to that level of detail just simply to, to help out. So we really appreciate you and, and your time to be here. Tell us where people can go to find your work. Mm, yeah, thanks, Casey. Uh, DigestiveHealthInstitute.org. They can find the books, the mobile app, or link to it at least, right? If, then you have to go to Google Play or, or iTunes Store. Um, they can join our Fast Tracked, T-R-A-C-T, Fast Tracked Diet official Facebook group. It's about 12,000 of us over there um, talking about uh, this type of approach and so forth. So yeah, those are the two best places. That's great. We will link that up in the show notes. Dr. Norm Robillard, thank you so much for appearing on our show again, coming with so much wisdom and knowledge and great things that we can implement. I think it really provides hope for people that are struggling with this, but also, you know, it, it's something that, again, I don't experience, you know, gut dysbiosis, but it's interesting to learn about. And it's, it can be something that can be very preventative for people that even aren't experiencing, experiencing that themselves. So we really appreciate you and the time you take to work with people and the time you take to be with us on our show. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Casey. Thanks for having me again. It's always an honor. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.